Hello G2, welcome back. I hope you had a lovely Easter. The sun's shining, he has risen indeed, and my dissertation has gone from a folder I'd conveniently hidden on my Google Drive to an anxiety dream that now keeps me up at night. Um, but we're in a new series here at G2. Um, as Hannah laid out, at the end of Matthew was the Great Commission. And that sets us up perfectly for the new series we're running in our YouTube videos, where we look at who are we? Who are we as Christians, as G2, as the national and international people of God? So this is running alongside our Sunday gatherings where we look at who is he. These small group videos are going to put a bit of flesh on the bone, a bit of practical action to reflect who he is. Like if we want our church to be sent into the local community as the Great Commission commands us, we need to ask ourselves and understand who are we as we go and do it. But maybe this is a tricky thing to think about. Maybe when you personally think of the church, think of who we are, especially if you think of a church trying to interact and counteract with what's happening in society, you don't see a reflection of the goodness of God. You see something a bit darker, maybe even something a bit more unsettling. Maybe your main concern is the institution and social justice. Maybe you look at the church's history and you don't see uh, institution that's on the side of the powerless, but you see a corporation that's reinforced racism, sexism, classism, homophobia, exploitation, ableism, in all different areas of life and society and caused so much pain and suffering. Maybe your concern's more personal. Maybe you see this church that's just judgmental, that's just intentionally and continually trying to point out why I'm a failure and why all my mates are as well. Or maybe it's just apathy. Like, we live in a post-COVID society, I could just watch a mega church, or just watch my home church. I could pray at home, I could worship at home, I could lob on a Jesus audiobook. What's the point in the church? To be fair, it might be none of those things. You might think about the church and think, this is a place where I found community, I found comfort, I felt a part of something bigger. I've been able to serve in a fulfilling way. No matter what your experience of church is or how you currently think of church, this series is aiming to answer some of those questions. It's hoping to talk about how we, as a church, can be a spiritual and a practical beacon in our community. So today we're looking at the church as the bride of Christ, because to be that beacon, we need to understand how God views us. This metaphor of the bride of Christ is used consistently throughout the Bible to detail how God views his church. If we don't focus on how God views us, we can't work in mission or feel aligned with the family of God because we won't feel confident or secure or empowered within our own community. So for other weeks, we're going to examine the fruit of the church. We're going to look at the church as choir, as disciples, as leaders, as light givers, as givers, brackets general. But before we get to any of those places, we need to ask why. Before we look at the fruit of the church, we need to look at what's being poured into it, what's water in the church, to poorly extend the analogy. This is why we're starting at the metaphor of the bride, because when we understand the church and the people of God as something that is loved and adored, and we place it in this broader gospel narrative, we get a glimpse of our purpose as a community, and we can better place ourselves inside it. So before we get cracking with this metaphor, let's have a chat around these two questions. Why do we go to church and why do you go to church? So in other words, like, why is church a thing? What's its purpose? But also, why do you personally go? Maybe what even brought you to G2? And then we'll come back in a bit. Amazing. I hope you had some good discussions. Um, I think to start, before we go anywhere else, we need to say, like, what actually is the church? Now, obviously, the church are the physical buildings you see around us. But if we ended there, I think we'd all be a bit concerned about the quality of G2's teaching. Because like Hannah laid out in the introduction, the church isn't just one building. It isn't a collection of institutions. It's the people of God. There are structured elements. There are institutions and church alliances and leadership teams. But the church are the people of God. And this isn't really just in a modern idea about inclusivity or universalism. This is what the Bible says. If we follow the church's history throughout the Bible and we start at the Israelites, the literal and physical people of God, 
We see that the church now, including G2, is built on the legacy of those people. The stories in the Old Testament are our church's history. They're an ongoing journey that God is bringing to completion that we'll touch on when we look at Revelation 19 and 21. But before the spirit was unleashed, before Jesus came and went, those physical buildings were important. If you look at Nehemiah and the rebuilding of the temple, it's a crucial part of the history of Christianity, but it's just a completely different interpretation to how we currently perceive the church. Instead, when we look now, we are all the church. Hence why the church is often referred to as this metaphorical body acting in unison with each other. Romans 12, 5 says, In Christ we, through many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. 1 Corinthians 12, 12 to 27, says each part of the church is a different part of the body, and how each requires each other. We are all part of this picture, and we all play our role. And we're all running alongside each other in family and in community. In Ephesians 2, 19 to 22, Paul addresses both the Jews and the Gentiles. He lays out this vision of unity for a church post-Jesus. He says that, consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling by which God lives by his spirit. We are all the church. The church isn't a club. It isn't a political party. We don't pay a couple quid so we can like have a pop at the other side whilst you know all the action happens around us. When we become Christians, we join the church and we join this international body of Christ. You are the church and we are the church together. And like Paul says in Ephesians, we're being built together in order to further the kingdom of God. So God can use us as a collective and as a community. And this is centred on Jesus as the cornerstone. The church is built on the foundation of apostles and prophets, and they have all centred themselves around Jesus. That's why Jesus told Peter in Matthew 16 that he was the rock on which I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. The church is Jesus's and Jesus is alone. He's going to build it and our ego needs to get out of the way. Over the coming weeks, I reckon we'll talk quite a lot about Acts 2, 42 to 47, because this is where we see the early church conducting itself. But before we talk about the signs and wonders and the generosity and the breaking of bread, before we start talking about the fruit of the ministry of the Acts 2 church, we need to recognise that that church started with devotion it started with Jesus and with him as the chief cornerstone. Therefore, the church is a family. It's an embodiment of the people of God. It's a called out group of people who are told to love Jesus and to strive after him. And that's why we're all invited. That's why this is an inclusive call. It's not just for the select few who seem a bit more religious or seem a bit more passionate. We're all invited to be a part of this body. When we become Christians and we engage in a relationship with Jesus, we are this body. And yeah, while the church is called to strive upwards and to love upwards, like everything we'll ever read about when it comes to God, he looks down and he loves us in return. This is where the metaphor of the bride is crucial to our original understanding of what the point of the church is, because it reveals something about the church, but it also reveals the gospel story to us afresh. Like, first off, it's really important that we're talking about a marriage when we're talking about this metaphor. Marriage is the most intimate form of relationship. It's not just like being a fan of something. I'm not married to Twitter or Bon Iver or parsnips, but to be fair, I do really like parsnips. Marriage is this devotion. It's a lifetime. And because we're chatting about God, it's an eternal commitment. That no matter what God is rooting for, committed to and bound to the church, God and the church are two partners trying to do life together. But like any part of the gospel, this romantic marriage story, it starts with sin and failure. The church and God may have been running through the fields of wheat hand in hand, but by the time we get to Ezekiel 16, 14, 63, we see this prophecy condemning Jerusalem, representing all of Israel, the people of God, as an adulterous wife. Ezekiel says that God spoke to him to confront Jerusalem with her detestable practices. And it details this long list of sin that Israel has committed from the sexual to the idolatrous to the slaughtering of children. 
The relationship described here is between God and Israel, the marriage of this old covenant that's ratified and proposed, but it was then broken in a multitude of different ways. But again, like any part of the gospel, this ends with redemption and restoration. We're going to look at Isaiah 54, 4 to 8, and we see the same Israel described by God. It's quite long, but it's really worth reading in full. God says, do not be afraid. You will not be put to shame. Do not fear disgrace. You will not be humiliated. You will forget the shame of your youth and remember no more the reproach of your widowhood. For your maker is your husband. The Lord Almighty is his name. The Holy One of Israel is your Redeemer. He is called the God of all the earth. The Lord will call you back as if you are a wife deserted and distressed in spirit. A wife who married young, only to be rejected, says your God. For a brief moment I abandoned you, but with deep compassion I will bring you back. In a surge of anger I hid my face from you. For a moment, but with everlasting kindness I will have compassion on you, says the Lord your Redeemer. God is talking to the holy people of Israel, the Jewish community, but again this is part of our history as a church. These stories, this relationship, is the historical foundation on which the current church, which includes G2, is built. We see these prophecies not just written for the time, but promises we can hold on to. These promises are true and we can rely and trust on them. We see God as a redeemer. We see the holy power of redemption and we see the power of restoration. We see God here not acting as a bit of a quick fix. This isn't some plaster to reach acceptability. This is a holy transformation towards being transformed into excellence. God is saying that any depth of sin, any distress, any humiliation, any fear, any shame is not too great for God to reach down and call us back. With deep compassion, he will bring us back. We see the impact of our sin in these verses, but we see the power of God's redemption too, and we see his everlasting kindness. And this is our story as a church. God sees us as a church community, as a bride of his. And the answer to the question of how this burning injustice is like completed is unsurprisingly found in the person of Jesus. Paul, in this broader message about marriage, commands husbands to love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church, without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In this same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife also loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body, just as Christ does the church, for we are members of his body. Jesus looks at the church and loves it. He paid the ultimate sacrifice, death on the cross, But he also demonstrates the minutiae here, the washing, the presenting, the lack of stains or wrinkles. God adores the church. And again, we are shown how we are all members of his body. God loves us individually, but loves us as a collective. We are restored to beauty, completely holy and blameless, not through our own actions, but through the power of redemption. And there will be a day when the whole church, the whole community of God and the whole body of Christ will be fully restored. Like the final of the gospel story, one day all pain will cease and all suffering will end. That's why Revelation 19 says, Revelation 19, 7 says, Let us rejoice and be glad and give the glory to him. For the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. And that's why Revelation 21, 2 says, And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. This is what underpins our metaphor when we talk about the bride and the church as something that has fallen, faded into sin, but been redeemed and one day will be fully restored. We see the gospel narrative not just applicable to our individual lives, but applicable as a collective for the whole church community. We see the church as the bride of Christ, an encompassing vision for all of us, and we can all play a part in this narrative. And it's from this that our action comes from. When we look at social justice, we look at being the choir, we look at discipleship, leadership, light giving, we look at generosity. Once we understand we are part of this grander vision, this bigger story, this gospel narrative, this leads us into a response. That's why Hebrews 12, 
says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and the perfecter of faith. Since we as G2 are surrounded by so many others within our local, our national and our international church community who are great witnesses, let's go for it. Tearing up our sin, moving forward as one into what we're called to do. This is the context for the rest of our series. This is what we're teeing up for because we are the bride of Christ and so everything else falls into place as we run after the pioneer and the perfecter of faith. If we want to challenge the assumption the church is outdated, we need to drill down and look backward at our history, at the people of Israel, but we need to look forward to the day of judgment where all justice will be complete. Then we can place ourselves, every one of us, as having a mandate for action in the now and not yet to bring about God's kingdom as an integral part of God's bride. So let's respond to this by having a conversation. Maybe you need to talk about your role in the church, potentially not feeling valued, feeling integral to the broader church community. Maybe you need to talk about your own experience of church. It might be fantastic to hear about what the church should be, what it ought to be, but your own experience is nothing like this. It's a crucial conversation we need to have because, as we've spoken about, the church can cause immense harm. It's completely fallible. Or maybe you feel inspired to action. You want to talk about your own vision for G2 or the wider church and where you feel called to run the race and push the church into it. Or maybe for you, the church has been a source of comfort, of encouragement, of empowerment, and you want to share your experience. Encourage the group that you've found family and you've learned that you're not alone. Wherever you are at and whatever you want to talk about, why don't we end in prayer? Let's pray to fully understand God's love for us and God's love for us as a community and a family as the bride of Christ.